I come in. Beginning of summer, it was just an empty thing, so I kind of built it out. You built all this yourself? Yeah, everything. Sound panels, the desk I built out. The thing is, I had so many kind of like all my drum machines and 303s and all these little bits. I just needed a kind of a wall of synth, so. You've got to talk us through some of this synth porn over here. Well, we've got a Moog, got a Roland SH09, 303, the uh, acid box, a Roland 202, 606, a Moog filter, the MS20 with a sequencer, which is kind of pretty much the brains of the studio, the sequencer, 909 drum machine, 101. Juno, you know, limited space. Going for that kind of sub feel, you know. Every space has got to be kind of used like a boat or a submarine. As a spot here, it's just brilliant for just kind of just practicing and really getting in the zone and. You know, one of the big things about my label I'm doing is I'm going to be doing these kind of, we're doing a club and one of the things we want to do is like the, the, the artists that we're thinking of getting over DJs is getting them down here, and being part of the booking is getting them down here to do a recording. Because you can come here on the boat. People, when they turn up and they've kind of ridden, you know, on the water to get here, they're in a different mind frame and the meeting just starts chilled, you know. So everyone, you know it's like, you know, you mess around with water for a bit and kind of certainly kind of calms you down a bit. What's the name of the label? It's called Drone. Drone? Drone, yeah, just Drone. Um, and it's, it's actually the name that we've been releasing. I mean, Satan Circus was released under that name, but it's never a, a label that I've actually been in control of properly. And this is the first time it's, you know, under my hands. Richard, you've got to talk me through your chalkboard up here. Well. I'm just being nosy, obviously. <laughs> Is this the wish list of what's coming or what? These are, the, yeah, just what's going on. My Death and Vegas live album, which I'm about to mix. Black Acid album, which I've mixed. A couple of singles on drone. This is. This is the nerve of, sensor. Death this is Vegas the nerve, nerve sensor of it all. If I've got it right, last time you were on tour, you had, the, you had the lasers from the gigs, which you then took out to do some other things. Kind, kind of, yeah. When I stopped doing Death and Vegas, went back to New York, went back to study photography, I guess my work was probably American you know, landscape, kind of broken beauty, kind of lost as a photographer trying to find a footing and a kind of direction. Anyway, and it wasn't until after touring with Death and Vegas again, but I started to kind of come up with a kind of conceive this idea why I wanted to kind of take my work. And the first kind of project I wanted to do was to take the club lighting that I was working with with the band and to put it into natural environments and remove, you know, sound and people from it and kind of change the context of what environment it was in and take still photos. So I did the, did the first one in ancient woodland and the next one was over a river and then a lake. We took lasers, smoke machines, about 300 meters worth of cabling and lighting to basically light up these s happenings as they became. So growing up then, what, what was your musical influences back then? When I, was, I, was, I was born and raised in Africa. And, well, first it was during the apartheid, so the TV wasn't really on because the only TV we could really pick up was Africana TV. So, you know, my dad didn't really, you know, it, it wasn't really uh, going down in our house, that's for sure. And we lived on, where I was born in Zambia, we lived right on the border of um, what was then the Belgian Congo. I mean, it was you know, quite hairy times. And because the TV wasn't on, the record player was on all the time. And it was, you know, one of my probably earliest memories was the power of selecting a song in the house and getting the reaction it got from, you know, my dad or my mum or my sister, you know, like. You know, at dinner there was always, a, you know, you'd put a record on and it was like, you know, you need to get that. Oh, that's a good choice. Yeah, good choice. Yeah, like that. You know, that, that, seeing that reaction was something I kind of really tried to kind of, to, uh, you know, appease, you know, 
so yeah, so p selecting music was a big part of the household. I think that's kind of was probably the biggest influence, you know. What about when you actually first started buying your own records? Seven years old, George Formby was my first uh, I remember the first seven inch I was really trying to get. I was really into no, I bought an album, George Formby album. I was really into musicals. So I got into George Formby, but um, and then and the big big thing was when was it seventy seven I was died? I remember I was ill actually, and um, I was having like these convulsions at the time, and I couldn't really work out what it was. And I was off school for a while, and there was just being Elvis films on every day, and all the musicals, and being really, really, really into Elvis. That was quite a big thing. And I started buying records, you know, quite religiously. And um, you know, by the time I was like, you know, 12, 13, I was that was it. You know, I had, like quite big collections. And then I started working in Reckless in the summer. And I worked in there in the summer holidays. And then a friend, and I moved into this kind of housing co-op and Barbara Ellen was living there and she was, you know, writing for Enemy at the time. So it was like sacks and sacks of records from her, you know. Didn't you do work experience at Enemy at one I point? I did, yeah. I just used to just go around and just basically just rifle through everyone's mail sacks and, yeah. Remember having any records was was quite a big big feature of um, the whole like, early '90s period, mm -hmm. and you you were kind of doorstep stepping them basically for 12 inch singles releases and whatever they had. I think I might have even you know waited outside Heaven League, you know, trying to bump into people at a certain stage. I remember my first introduction to a lot of that scene was actually being in Black Market Records when I was God knows what age. And this record played. And I remember turning around to Ashley Beadle, who was playing the record in the shop, working there. I was like, oh, you know. There was all these DJs and me kind of like, you know, like spotty, like 16 year old kid behind or something. Anyway, and I asked what a record was. And uh, the guy next to me kind of mumbled something. I didn't hear it and pretended I'd heard him. And, um, and then when the record fi finished, he turned around and said, I'll give it to him. And it was Andrew, it was Weverall. And it was the first, I think it was the first Saves of Paradise track, a white label. And then after that, there was a few times like when I'd gone up to Andrew and asked him what a record was at a drum club and he would like kind of give me the record when he'd finished playing it. You know, and so Andrew was a massive, you know, massive influence on me musically. Because I was kind of coming from this kind of, you know, Velvet Underground Stooges, they were the bands I kind of you know, grew up on as a teenager. And Barbara kind of got me into kind of like, gave me a kind of Chicago mixtape. And then on top of that, like Andrew's kind of, you know, career was, he was like DJing those and, you know, bring this DJ kind of brought together kind of the dance scene and the kind of indie scene. It was kind of like real segue kind of for people like me. Gossips, Bean Street, circa 1994. Yeah. Was it? The Job Club, yeah. That's Friday where I night. Started DJing. Tell me through the three main DJs that, that were at the Job Club Carl Reckless, Owen Shameless, and Richard Fearless. So, is that how the Fearless was born? It was, yeah, yeah. So, how are you kind of anointed that name? I think it was something to do with our antics at the time. Um, but um, I don't think it was. Uh, I think it was just, yeah, just kind of trouble. See, I'm always amazed because you love, you love your space, the great outdoors, but there you are in Gossips, with a nickname like Fearless. Well, I mean, it's a hard world to be in that world. I mean, the last, um, when we did Contino Sessions, Scorpio Rising and Satan Circus, it was done in the basement of the studio, which we had for about 10 years. and. Uh, and, you know, working in that environment and not having kind of any kind of... We, we couldn't even see daylight, let alone kind of, you know, 
and it, it's hardcore, you know, it's really, it's really, really hardcore at the moment, yeah. I think to be immersed in club culture, you definitely need it, an antidote to that, and this is my antidote, I guess. I don't think I've ever been to a studio like this. Well, I'm actually going to start growing out there as well, because if you go around the other side, a lot of people have got gardens, a lot of the old spaces have got really amazing, like, front gardens, and they, they really like people growing, so we're going to start kind of put a load of pots and start kind of growing out there as well. A little south-facing garden. Sounds like a dream. Yeah. The big dream. What label? What label? Drone. Drone garden. <laughs> drone who? Yeah. Check out my mint. What's your big obsession? Outdoors, really. I mean, kind of, you know, just trying to be kind of, you know, trying to be, have a lot of space around me and be outside and kind of, kind of quite, quite solitary, you know. We spend a lot of time alone. And space is something I kind of always search for in my music, certainly. I think it's probably one of the reasons why Death and Vegas has always been kind of used for a lot of so much films, because I think there's quite a lot of space in there. And I think in music it's it's really important to, you know, less is definitely a, is more in a lot of the, uh, the music I write, I think. You were called um, Dead Elvis. Dead Elvis for a while. There was actually a record label called Dead Elvis. I think that's what it was in Ireland, which I don't think it's around anymore. But it was, it was. They had, had registered the name. I think we had to change for them. And then a friend of mine had made a film, which with Lee Bowery playing Elvis. It was the last thing Lee Bowery was in actually before he died. And it was about like the last 15 minutes of Elvis's life. His fictitious event. And uh, it was called Death in Vegas, and I, I had like a night to change the name or something like that, and decided to call it Death in Vegas. Because for a while you were black acid. Death in Vegas had sort of stopped. It was no yeah. more. I went to live in New York, went back to college, and while I was there, I, I started this other band. This, with, is, this is black acid. This is black acid, and it's kind of you know straight up kind of rock and roll outfit. We rehearsed for a year in a warehouse, and then we, we went in the studio in, in Michigan and put the album down straight, no effects, nothing. It was just kind of the way people used to record records as opposed to trekking and doing, you know, the studio kind of records that I've made over the years with Death and Vegas, which are very much about bringing people individually and, you know, not working in the traditional way of just going in the studio and, you know, Pouring out a record, but yeah, no, the Black Acid album. I've been sitting on it now for, for I think about six years, and now I have my label. I have an avenue to put it out, but it's I don't know. And it was a weird one. I just didn't have any desire. It was a bit of a um, the whole process of doing that record was quite full on, and and it was almost kind of it's quite cathartic and getting it done. It was kind of like that, you know, just delivering it, you know, and kind of getting it mastered was enough. I didn't really need to kind of deal with putting it out. And I also felt like it would, it had longevity because it wasn't like an electronic record. It's a record that just sounds like a lost album. So at the right time, I'll put it out. But it's certainly something I'm really proud of. We went to New York, disappeared for a bit. Yeah, I just kind of got up and just left, really, quite suddenly. I think I'd just, you know, since college I'd done... I'd f fell into Death in Vegas kind of accidentally. And it wasn't my plan, you know, I was kind of... As far as I was... In my in my brain, you know, since I got my my scholarship when I was 13, my art scholarship, that I thought I was going to be a painter, and that was, that was it, you know, and that's what I'd been... You know, and I started working for... Preparing for that scholarship when I was probably about 11 you know, getting portfolios together and stuff like that. So my thought, you know, I just thought I was going to be a painter and that was it. And then started, you know, collecting records, working in a record shop and Reckless and Mr Bongo and building up a big record, record collection and kind of got into DJing that way. And um, asked to got, do a remix for someone and had a couple of hours spare in the studio and did Opium Shuffle, which was the first Death and Vegas track, and got a five album deal off the back of one single. It was a very different day, say, different days then. And kind of the next thing, I had a rec recording contract and I was still at college and it was like, whoa, this wasn't supposed to happen. 
kind of the whole art thing got put on the side. We didn't get put on the side because I was able to incorporate into Death and Vegas as much as I could, you know, still doing all the artwork and as many of the videos as I could. But, um, yeah, and then, you know, putting the brand on hold, it was just kind of going back to working out my brain what I wanted to, do, what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do and having a break from something that was all consuming, really. So you've got the music and you've got the art. Which mm. is a vehicle for which? I don't really, to be honest, kind of have any separation in any of them, really. Um, they're kind of on, on, constantly ongoing and there's no really kind of, you know, it's not like, right, I'm going to be working on art today. It's like, it's, it's all part of the same process, really. I come in here and it's whatever project I've got, you know. The moment I'm just about to do is uh, working with this uh, label, Bureau B in Hamburg, this Krautrock label, but going through their archives, working on some compilations and, you know, switching between working on that and working on my artwork and new Death and Vegas material and new Richard Fierce material. But, um, you know, it's all coming from the same side of the brain. You know? It's all about the moment. You know, it's about creating and searching for that moment when you're really, really happy with something, whether it be a song or a concept or whatever. It's like, that's the buzz for me, and that's where it ends. So what time do you finish up here? If I'm working my own, I work to last train at half 12. Really? Yeah. What time they switch on the light bulb? Well, I was actually, <laughs> I was going to ask if I could get it connected to my studio so I could, I could turn it on when I had an idea. <laughs> it's like this, everyone knows, like, ding! 